I'm going to take this box out in the backyard and I'm going to squirt the lighter fluid into the box and I'm going to set fire to all of this stuff. I just want this ranger stuff to be burned. I'm going to go root for an English professional uh, football team. I don't care. I, I cannot deal with another year of misery. Obviously, when I woke up the next day and saw the headline smashed with, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm going to guarantee it when I kind of wanted to roll back into the covers and say, uh, call it a day, but... Uh, it didn't really, after that, uh, it didn't really affect me once the game started. You know, I mean, it all comes down to this game. Our season's over if we don't perform. And, uh, you know, there's, there's no tomorrow. The Eastern Conference Final from a packed house at the Meadowlands in East Rutherford, New Jersey. The Devils and the New York Rangers. The Devils win it. They move on to the final. The game pretty much from the start is is a devil's rampage. Niedermeyer centering. Look out, score! Center, Niedermeyer, score! The team was just, um, just didn't have it. And you could just sense that here it was, here was another disappointment, another huge disappointment was about to hit the Rangers. Rangers down 2-0, one minute left to go in the first period. They lose, and their season is over. And what happens is, we're sitting there, the Rangers go down 2-0, and we're like, this is it, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna be done here. Yeah, and we didn't know what to do, so we, we, we kind of put rally jerseys on, we moving, threw them in the corner, we moved the furniture, we did everything we can. We were just focused on our game, I mean, we were, uh, felt we had the momentum, uh, and we showed it because we came out in game six and were dominating the first 20 minutes of that hockey game. And, you know, we're up 2 nothing, and I had a little running with Mark behind the net, and I, you know, I, I could see in his eyes, uh, you know, he was frustrated. They go up 2 nothing. I mean, they score early in the first period, and I, all I can say, I don't want to look at the bench and say, do, do not pull me. I feel great. I just want to keep playing, and I just hope that he doesn't start benching people and pulling me and changing things around. This young Devils team with a rookie goalie named Martin Brodeur and a bunch of workmanlike forwards, not many superstars, are outplaying the Rangers. They're outworking them. After a Devil-dominated first period, the Rangers are in trouble. The first period is over, and the New York Rangers will hear the chant of 1940 from the Devils fans as they head out. You know, we just sat there in disbelief with our, with our chins um, in our hands, saying, you know, we just, we just couldn't believe what was happening. I watched it, and about halfway through the second period, I just went upstairs, and I went into my room, and I shut the door, and I sat down on the floor with this box of my Ranger stuff and the lighter fluid. And the voice of reason in my head is asking, are you really going to set fire to this stuff and give up on the Rangers? 2 nothing lead for the Devils. Second period about to start. Rangers being outshot 17-10 to and trailing by a score of 2 nothing. They are about to run the Rangers out onto the New Jersey Turnpike. And Mike Richter single-handedly decides that the Rangers are not going to be eliminated on this night. And he holds them in the game. The ice is now slanted towards Mike Richter. Saved by Richter. Saved by Richter. Rebound. Saved by Richter. McLean. He was making save after save, and we were able to weather their, their kind of their storm, and yet we were still down. And Mike Richter's holding the fort right now for the New York Rangers. If it wasn't for, uh, for Mike Richter, the game could easily have been 5-1. to one. They had a ton of chances to make it 3-0, and Mike Richter had stood on his head. And then slowly, the momentum started to change. Without Mike that game, uh, we would have never got to the third period, but he gave us an opportunity to stay in that game with her another heroic, uh, I might add, uh, performance. You almost felt that because they missed those chances, that it was going to come and bite them. First time in this game where the Rangers have put on a couple of flurries in the last two shifts. Mike Keenan had made a good move at that point and started moving lines around a little bit, trying different combinations. And, you know, we put Mark and, and Kovalov out there together. And Alex was our most talented player on the team. And he got an opportunity with a little space. Mike Messier comes. Rangers need one. Desperately. Kovalev. All along. Kovalev shot. He scores. He got one. And that really gave us a huge momentum boost. 
um, at the end of that second period going into the third. If the Rangers could come back and win this game, there will be a game seven. As they went to the locker rooms for that second intermission, you could palpably feel in the building that everything had changed and that third period was going to be something special. At least when that third period started now, there was hope because that Kovalev goal not only created a one-goal differential, but also now was starting to create some pressure for the devil. Third period, game six. The New Jersey Devils lead in the series three games to two and can wrap it up here. We were able to string some passes together going up the ice. Leach comes down, drops it off down on the wing. Kovalev moving in. Kovalev to Messier. Messier shot. And he puts a shot right over Brodeur's glove. It all said, you know, Mark scores one goal, and it all said it's tied. Now it's 2-2. Now everybody's conjuring the guarantee. Messier's just got the Rangers back to even. Now it's a Ranger building. Now the Devil fans are nervous. Now the Ranger fans in the building are electric. And you can sense that something is happening. Four, remember, Leach moving it in. And then there's a few shifts, and then Leach, Kovalev, and Messier are on the ice again together. And this incredible passing sequence, and there's Mark in front. Leach drops it, Kovalev again, save on the rebound, score! Mark Messier gets his second goal! The Rangers lead 3-2! So Mark Messier is writing the stuff of which legends are made. And now they're just several minutes away from bringing it back to the Garden for Game 7. Jacques Lemaire, the first-year coach of the Devils, decides to pull his goalie. Jacques Lemaire is going to go for it, try and get this thing tied up with a minute 53 to go in the third. Messier won the draw. Let's declare it around. John McLean tries to send the puck from in front. Messier grabs it. That was on the ice right behind him. I could see it was basically dead center. The empty net. Mark Messier. Don't you believe it? When it went in the net, it clicked. I said, he just got a hat trick. He just scored a hat trick in the third period. He called that we we're going to win, he gets the game winner, and now he's just throwing in a hat trick. And I'm like, I just started laughing. I said, that is, that is ridiculous. He said we will win game six. Everything changed. Everything changed about how we looked at Mark Messier. Everything changed in how we looked about the Rangers. And um, everything changed about all the negativity that had uh, accompanied this team between games four and game five. That was when I finally let myself celebrate and say, I don't believe what I just saw. I don't believe that he guaranteed a win. I don't believe that he scored a hat trick. I don't believe that there's actually going to be a game seven. This is what was supposed to happen. This is the moment that he was brought here to do. I watched him skate over to the bench with his arms raised and I just kind of glided to the bench and was just shaking my head and said, I can't believe what he just pulled off. It's like it was such a, a you know, cool movie he just made. You know, it was just one more moment of that season that was so uh, special. And if you didn't believe that anything was possible after that, then you're out of your mind. We, we just saw something that was almost biblical. You know, predict, guarantee, and then hat trick, come on. And for Mark Messier to come away with a hat trick and for Mike Richter to play the way he did early in that game was one of the great, if not the greatest single achievement in my estimation of all time in any sport in the greatest city in the world, four sports in New York. That was one of the greatest individual demonstrations that the game of hockey has ever seen throughout its history. May 27th, 1994. This was it. My house, game seven. My wife's cooking. My cousin's bringing over a beer ball. We got the game on. I did commit the cardinal sin of booking the tickets to Vancouver for the finals, which was going to start the week later. So now I'm starting to get it on both ends. How could you do this? They're going to lose now. We don't lose in my house. No. So we, we, it was a guaranteed Not win. Not until your mother-in-law calls. <laughs> Madison Square Garden is ready. And so are the New Jersey Devils and New York Rangers. At this
this point, both teams understand and realize that the margin of difference between the two teams is minute. This was kind of the way it was supposed to happen. You couldn't have scripted it any better. They're not going to give us an inch, and we're not either. And so the game goes as you would expect. Game seven was nerve-wracking. So competitive, intense. A helmet popper. Boom. It's an absolute war physically, uh, mentally. Richie, nice moves. Takes the shot to save by Richter. There's good chances at both ends. There's great defensive play. There's great offensive play. So much at stake for these two teams. The fans that stand and cheer doesn't get any better. We're seeing great action by two great teams having a great season in a seventh game. The game remained scoreless entering the second period until the Rangers' star defenseman unveiled an unlikely move. Face-off, harmless in the devil's zone to the right of Rodor. Rangers won the face-off. Each moves down to the puck. Each takes it along the boards, goes behind the net, and you just figure he's going to go all the way around the net to do a wraparound. I had watched Doug Gilmore do a move in the playoffs a couple years before where he did a little spin and it caught the goalie going one direction. And as I was going behind the net, Garen had me cut off, and I knew he was just going to run me into the board. Garen goes by Leach and lets Leach have time and room. I just said, oh, I'm going to give this a try, and I did a little spin and threw it in front. Now it's skill time, and that's a skill move. And I remember looking at the puck behind Brodeur over the line, and I just said, that, uh, that puck just went in. That kid scores! Ryan Leach gives the Rangers a 1-0 lead. There was no way that I would think that we would win a game 1-0. That just seemed ridiculous. That's just, you know, we're not going to win 1-0. It's either going to get tied or we have to get a couple more goals to make it a little safe. But 1-0, it's just, it's just not going to happen. It was the strangest thing as that game went on. It was really, really quiet. And I re remember trying to be, you know, psychoanalyzing the crowd. They're nervous. They don't know what to do. The greatest sport in the world is spreading its stuff right here in Game 7 of this series with the Rangers leading 1-0. Being Ranger fans for so long, you know, we're kind of waiting for that other shoe to drop. We can see the Devils are starting to take the play to the Rangers. They're starting to get some good looks on Richter. Garrett on Wells. Garrett is stopped by Richter. It almost looks like the Rangers are starting to wear down a little. Adam Graves was nailed, absolutely nailed in front. Slow getting up. Being the pessimistic Ranger fan, you you know, you always see the worst happening. Garrett reaching for the puck. Rangers don't see it. You don't have the confidence in your team. You've seen it happen before. You've seen them blow leads before. McKay looking for the puck. He's tied up. Richter reaching for it. It's still loose. By the time we got to the end of the third period, with the Rangers holding a 1-0 lead. 5-18 to go in the third period. Okay, another five minutes, another four minutes, another three minutes. Under two minutes remaining. We're looking at the clock. We're just watching the time. 18,200 people on their feet in Madison Square Garden as the Rangers are a minute and ten seconds away. And so the Devils pull Brodeur, and you're you're sweating it out. This game wins it. Farmer can't clear. I'm thinking, oh, this, this game's over. We're, you know, we're going to the Stanley Cup. We're going to the Stanley Cup. The faceoff was down on the left corner on our bench side. Nichols against Messier. Messier wins. It's loose. Back behind the net. I'm on the bench, and Nemtinos beside me. And Sergey goes, uh, OK, we're going to win. I go, we're not. We haven't won anything yet. Driver blocks it. Larmer's on him. Richie centers. Mazzella Putin gets the puck in front of the net with a couple seconds left. I make a save. Stop by Richter! I think, you know, I have it under me, and he keeps whacking away at it. One whack, two whacks, three whacks, and time just can't go quick enough. The Devils score! They have tied it! The Devils have tied it with 7.7 .7 seconds to go! Collectively, 18-5 in the garden. All going down together. The misery, the heartache, the frustrations of 50 years coming to fruition with seven seconds left to go in the game. Madison Square Garden fans are stunned. The Rangers were 7.7 .7 seconds away from the Stanley Cup final, and it will go to sudden death overtime. With seven seconds left in the game, 
and my phone rings, and it's my mother-in-law, and she wants to speak to me to congratulate me on a Rangers victory before everybody else starts to call. While I'm on the phone with my mother-in-law, uh, they drop the puck, and uh, Selipukin scores, and the Devils tie the game. And with, that, and with that, I ripped the phone out of my kitchen wall, throw it on the floor, saying that she jinxed us. The yeah. whole house is now saying that my mother-in-law jinxed us. How could she call? I mean, it had landlord call, too. What my, is going on down my there? My landlord called from upstairs saying, what's you going on? the phone because that little wall. <laughs> <laughs> it was a mess. We had to go find the other phone that was ringing. When Valerie Zellepukin scored that goal, I turned from my perch up in Section 411, where I have my tickets, and... I just full cocked my arm back and I popped the exit sign. Bulb splatted, loud popping noise, and now I have blood engulfing my whole hand. So we go downstairs to the men's room, we take a wad of paper towels, and I just wrap my whole arm up like a mummy. And I'm carrying my hand like this as I come back upstairs for the first overtime. Now we're going into overtime, and we all went outside. We, we actually took the beer ball with us out. We took park. the beer ball outside right across the street from my house. Now we got 20 minutes. We're trying to drink the whole thing. To walk into that locker room that moment, it, it was amazing because you, you're not human if you're not upset. Somehow, in the next 15 or 20 minutes while the Zamboni's on, We've got to get it out of our mind that all that we're looking forward to has been put on hold and we have this job to complete. I walked in, I looked at them, their heads were down, they were really dejected. And I said, I want you to imagine just how great you're going to feel when we score that goal. At that instance, their heads all came up and Mark said, you're bloody right. We're tied at one and here we go. We were on our toes, we were a confident group, and it showed in the overtime. Backhander saved by Brodeur on Braves. They put a lot of shots on Brodeur. They had the majority of the play in the Devil's End. Centering passes in front and stopped by Brodeur. They could hardly get out of their own end. We are five minutes and 47 seconds into overtime, and the Rangers have had seven shots. The Devils have had none. We knew they would have a chance. Even if they had one shot, Ricky would have to make a stop. McLean in front. Here's Riche, and it's blocked. Through the first overtime, I think I had three or four more of these, what I thought were heart attacks. I didn't really care. Here's a two-on-one for the Devils. McKay and Holik. McKay for Holik, and it's chipped out. It's saved by Lincoln. I actually remarked at one point that if I die at this point, at least I don't have to suffer with how the game ends. McTavish back to Dale Noonan. At any moment, it was going to be euphoria or it was going to be desolation. Can they call it a draw and send both teams to the finals against Vancouver? I mean, no one deserves to lose. This is, yeah, this is an incredible play. And it just keeps going on and on and on. How long can this last? I mean, this is really just becoming excruciating. Double overtime for the third time in this series. In overtime, I'm one to, to say, like, oh, okay, you know, Messier's gonna win it here, or watch, here comes a leech goal. It, it's fun to predict it, and it's fun to see, like, who, like, who's gonna step up? Who's gonna be the... We are back, moments away from the start of the second overtime. So the players are on the ice, both teams are warming up, but Mattel was still in the locker room getting a skate fixed. The only two guys left in the dressing room at the time was me and Eddie Olchek. Maddie, in his broken English, he pretty much said, Eddie, come on, give me some luck. And I remember just grabbing a stick and uh, putting my lips on his blade a little bit. As a joke, I told him when I was ready, so I'll be back in five minutes with the winning goal. And he, uh, he said, if you can do that, that would be great. I can almost remember the entire four and a half minutes that took place in double overtime. First, Messier has this incredible opportunity where he's off to the side of the net and somebody along the board just throws something at Brodeur. Hold the net, save, rebound, save Brodeur! There it is, Mark Messier, he's gonna win it for us. Boof, nothing. And then the Devils take it down all the way down the other end of the ice. Bernie Nichols will rebound out in the high slot and he had the empty net and I was on the bench already standing up with my arms in the air ball game over. Richard shoots, save Richter, rebound! Richter's looking for the puck and it's hitting like three or four skates. And as Sam just yells out, where's the puck? Where's the puck? It's in the corner, and has got it. You know, just a few seconds later, Bukamum drives it in. And I remember JD saying, wow, Matteau looks really... Guaranteed fresh? Ah, oh, this is gonna be expensive.
Wait, it's not expensive? It's an Aldi thing. Really fresh out there. I remember thinking to myself, put your stick down and good things might happen. The tee saw for the Devils plays it cross ice into the far corner. Matteau swoops in to intercept. The puck had gone into the corner and I saw Stefan Matteau coming around the net. I didn't think he was going to try and stuff it in. I thought he'd, you know, maybe take it by the boards or pass it out in front to someone. Interesting enough, there was a discussion about Bill Durham moving from right to left. And when he did, he would put his paddle down. I put my stick down and I just had a very weak shot on net. It's funny, I, I'm about as distant as you can be on the ice. And I'm looking and just... I swear I thought I saw the puck go in there. I saw the puck going in very, very slowly. I didn't hear the crowd going crazy because they couldn't see it. Mateau's hands go up. I saw the light go on. And then the place went berserk. Explodes off of Madison Square Garden. I have people jumping all over me, and I'm trying to keep my arm up in the air like this because it's thriving. Jumping up and down, screaming. Another call from the I landlord. landlord again. He wants him out of the house. He has the house. The landlord calls, and it was almost like you still have to let yourself. That's it. It's over. Like they're not going to call back. It, it's over. We're going to the finals. There's a woman behind me in the front row, so she's got these great seats, and she's freaking out, and she's cheering, and she looks down at me, and she said, this is my first hockey game, and I said, don't ever go to another one, because it'll never come close to this. Aside from a child being born or getting married, I got to throw that in for my wife, I'm sure she loves that, but there's never been any feeling I've ever had that comes close to that. And No idea who scored. My guess was Tekin in. And to this day, I'm Howie Rose. Amazing job by you. When I left the building that night, and I'm listening to FAN, and they're playing the call seemingly every five minutes, and all the people calling in were as happy and excited about the call as they were about. The game. The tee saw for the Devils plays a cross ice. Matteau swoops in to intercept. Matteau behind the net, swings it in front, he scores! Matteau, 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 Stefan Matteau. And the Rangers have one more hill to climb, baby. It's Mount Vancouver. The Rangers are headed to the finals. 7 a.m. the next day, and I say to myself, I think I better go to the hospital just to get my hand checked out. So I walk into the emergency room, and the uh, doctor comes over to me, sees my hand like this, I got white jersey on, I got blood all over. He's like, did we win? I was like, we did it, we're going to the finals. He goes, did you play? I was like, no, I was just watching the game. And the doctor started laughing, and it was like, don't worry, you'll be all right. Got a couple of stitches and took the hand with me to Vancouver. The Rangers beat the second best team in hockey in the semifinal, and the final should have been a coronation, and it really looked like it was going to be. The first game, Kirk McLean stole it. Tip on goal, kicked away, save McLean, and he's got it underneath him. I don't know how he kept it out, but he did. The Rangers put up 54 shots on goal. 54 shots on goal, and we lose. But even though we lost game one, we still had the momentum. Never for one second did we waver or lose hope. It's heading for the empty net. The Rangers will win. Game two, beat them. Game three, beat them. And that's it. The Rangers win it five to one. Game four, you go into Vancouver, and Mike Richter makes the save of his life, the save of maybe any goalie's life on Pavel Bure on the penalty shot. Pavel Bure getting set. Everyone on their feet at Pacific Coliseum. Penalty shots are great because you have a chance to help your team out. It's dramatic. It's one-on-one. -on -one. In some ways, it's easier. 
I know what's coming. Puck's sitting at center ice and just me against him. Here comes Boray against Mike Richter. He came with a ton of speed and I came out far and just tried to match it going back. I tried to take the shot away and have him deke and I was able to get my leg on it. Saved by Richter! My lord, what a save! What a stretch by Richter! You feel good right then. It gives a boost to your team and then you go on and we did go on and win that game. The New York Rangers will head home with a chance to win the Stanley Cup! It's a mismatch. You know, God bless the Canucks. They had an amazing run to the final, but they are outclassed. There was great anticipation on that flight home. And so by the time the morning of June 9th, 1994 rolled around, I think everybody in New York was ready for a parade. I remember coming out of the shower and I was shaving and I kept on looking in the mirror and I'm saying, okay, what are the thoughts that I want to incorporate into a Stanley Cup call. The mayor's office in the city wanted to know about a parade date. We had to have preparations made by somebody for champagne in the locker room. Rangers with a 3-1 lead over the Vancouver Canucks. We were reading about prices people were paying for this ticket, how everyone had to be there. <laughs> There's people outside with tinfoil Stanley Cups. We're all excited. The whole garden is buzzing. Ranger fans have waited collectively since 1940, but today Ranger fans feel the wait is about to end. You knew the cup was in the building. I knew the man whose job it was to escort the cup and put it in the box and go with it on the plane and get a first-class seat for it and polish it up. Going up that ramp and seeing the security people, the police, the fans that were there, the workers from the arena, and when we took the cup in its case out of the back of the van and the amount of people that were there, I think half of them forgot that they were even working there. These were people who had never, ever seen a championship. Some of them never really saw the Rangers come close. John wanted a Stanley Cup to play for, so I brought him one. <laughs> about as close as we've been. This was going to be their day, and there was no denying that the Rangers were going to win the Cup. i got to tell you, that scared the heck out of me. The Rangers hit the ice for Game 5. I think everyone was getting way too excited being through it so many times, winning five cups with Edmonton and being to the Stanley Cup final six times prior. In any series that you're in, that fourth game is always the hardest one to win. One thing we should mention, there is another team in New York that's going to play this game tonight. Any pro athlete, when you've got him down, he's going to play the hardest he's ever played in his life. They had nothing to lose. We had everything to lose. You know, they were the bad guys, the villains. We were the good guys. We're going to win the cup. And all of a sudden, boom. It was just a complete blitz. I mean, Vancouver scores the first three goals. Save made. Richter rebound. Score! Hold the party. Hold the party. It's an incredible deflation. What went from absolute pandemonium just was utter silence. A 3-0 lead for the Vancouver Canucks. They have not had this in this series. And then we started coming back. It was 3-1, to 3-2, to two, and then Messier scores this beautiful patented goal off the wing. Score! And they blow that! Mark Messier, 3-3! And honestly, at that point, I really thought, maybe we are going to win this. I think it was the next shift. One of their defensemen, Babbage, just takes a shot that goes along the ice. Shot! Going, oh no, how could that have just happened? Dave Babbage came back to give them the game winner that made it 4 3 after the Rangers had tied it. And the Rangers, who put a flurry on to overcome a 3 0 deficit, still lose the game by three goals. Stanley Cup letdown was probably as painful a loss, of course, as they'd ever experienced at Madison Square Garden. But, you know, thankfully they did have the cushion of a Game 6 and maybe a Game 7. I wonder if many of the fans who left the building that night felt as I did that we're coming back. We've seen the Rangers long enough to know that there's going to be a Game 7. that game in Vancouver, I remember taking a walk after the game, thinking, you know, we didn't, we just didn't lose. We got killed here two games in a row. You know, how are we ever going to recover? It was a miserable time. 
We could hear the riots downtown. Mike wanted to then go back to Lake Placid. He wanted to stay away from the media because we had two days off. And he wanted to get the team away from the New York cauldron. And Mark wouldn't have it. Kevin Lowe wouldn't have it. Uh, if we're going to slay this dragon, we're going to face him, you know, we're going to look him eye to eye, and we're going to go to New York and we're going to face the music. What we're looking at is we've got an opportunity to go home for Game 7 to win the Stanley Cup. And, and like I said, what more could you ask for than that? The day before Game 7, Keenan went to his players and said in a heartfelt speech that Messi called the best speech he gave all season, I am behind you guys 100%. I said, we started this mission this journey with one goal in mind. After going through the challenges and the hardships of what pressures a city like this can put on you, I said, you don't have any responsibility to anyone except yourselves and your teammates. He came out and had a great speech. We basically took that and kind of ran with it. a hockey game for the ages. One game to decide whether Ranger fans experience euphoria or despair. I remember getting a phone call from a friend of mine telling me that there's a guy that wants to spend $5,000 a ticket to go to the game and that would be willing to buy our seats. What'd you say? No way. I waited too long for, that, for this to happen. I want to see that cup won tonight and that $20,000 is not going to change my life. The cup will. So you had two tickets to Game 7 uh, of the Stanley Cup Finals in 94, and uh, it, it was actually the same night as, as my high school prom. I'm supposed to go to the prom with this girl. She's a senior. She's a good friend of mine. I didn't want to disappoint her. So luckily, her father brokered a deal, uh, which I accepted, where that I would go to the pre-prom party. The limo going down to the prom would drop me off at the garden. It's at 1027, WNEWF, and the champagne is on ice. I come dashing out of the limo, and the only people that are there are police officers, and they're looking at me like I'm crazy. Here's this kid holding his Ranger jersey in one hand, wearing, you know, most of a tuxedo, and they're looking at me. I'm like, no, I yell at the cops, I'm skipping my prom. Game seven, I dropped my son off for school at 7.30 in the morning, and I went down to Madison Square Garden, and I was there at 8 o'clock in the morning for a game that started at 8 o'clock that night. I brought my long range of silver bullet from when I was six years, just 38 years ago, which means the Rangers are going to win the Stanley Cup tonight. Why would I go there 12 hours early? I couldn't do anything else that day. I might as well be there. God forbid there was a problem in the Lincoln Tunnel. I felt it just was where I wanted to be. And the longer I sat there, the more confident I felt. Walking into the garden that night, everybody was walking around with the makeshift Stanley Cups, and everybody was wearing a jersey. Not only that, we knew the cup was in the building because somebody was getting the cup that night. You know, there's no advancing to the next round. When you wake up tomorrow, you're either a champion or you're answering the questions about what went wrong. It felt like Armageddon was coming. I have been coming to this building since 1968 when it opened. I have never heard anything like this. The garden is raucous as anything. It's loud. I mean, it was so loud before the start of the game that you can barely hear John Amarante sing the national anthem. I'll never forget that. It's one of my favorite moments of playing, and, and I, I think back and I can, I can feel myself in that spot. It was definitely, we want the cup. We want the cup. The chance of we want the cup going up from the crowd here at Madison Square Garden. The hair on the back of your neck stood up. The energy was, was, was fantastic. It's so strange. It's like going into church on your wedding day. You know you're going to remember what happens in these walls forever. And it was sort of what Mike Keenan said in the beginning. See that parade, this video that I'm showing you? That's what it's all going to be like. And if we do that, we'll walk together forever. And here we were, finding out whether that was all going to come true or not. It's a one-game shot. The fans are standing already. Coming out for game seven, you could sense the crowd was excited. We knew we'd have a distinct advantage if we could get that first goal. SCA slowed down by Boring, gets by him. SCA cuts in, still with a puck. Nice pass to Zubal. Boom, right away, off. Oh, my God, what a beautiful feed it was. Zubal, 
Beasley. I remember putting my skate behind my stick, settling the puck. I knew I had the empty net, and I just guided it into the net. just standing straight up with my arms up in the air and that was it one nothing when that first goal now is scored you can feel in the building the expectations building and building and building it was such a cool feeling to, to know that we were up one nothing in game seven but it was a chippy game there was a lot going on but anderson got hurt on the play he's down we ended up with a power play still in the first period, and Kovalov made an awesome move getting into the zone on the left side. And I know that I had tried to go glove side on Kirk McLean a few times, and I knew if I had the same opportunity again, I was going to try stick side, and, and that's exactly where I shot it. Luckily enough, it went in. Nothing. It's looking good. We start the second period. And all of a sudden, Linden scores. It's going to be a break for Trevor Linden. He moves to the net, and he scores! And the Canucks have scored to cut the Rangers' lead. We have a, a one-goal lead. It's still optimistic, and then Messier puts one in. Newton's back in. I'm not sure, quite sure if he actually touched the puck or not, but uh, it doesn't matter because he got credited and it's 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 a perfect uh, fit. I really felt that was a huge goal at that time. I, I just felt that it was enough the way Richter was playing, the way the game was going. Final seconds of the second standing ovation. The Rangers are 20 minutes away. At the end of the second period, uh, Bob Raceman, the TV radio reporter for the Daily News, was there, and he said, so what do you think? And I just looked at him and I said, this is going to be the longest 20 minutes of my life. And we are set for the third period. Trevor Linden scored early in the third period on a power play, as we knew he would. Running to Cardinal. He shot it. Suddenly, he caught a nail biter. Seventh game, you know, last few minutes, what's going to happen? Brown shoots, saved by Richter. That 10 minutes took forever, and it took 54 years. That's what it felt like. So many tight plays throughout those entire playoffs in that game. Post being hit. Hit the post, and it's cleared by Lowe. Oh, man, Vancouver came out so close to tying it. Sticks being lifted at the last second, just getting a toe on a shot. Up, he shoots, save Richter. This will actually be happening. They're going to score a goal, Vancouver. Now I'm nervous again. You, as a Ranger fan, were really, really nervous because you realized that this was it. Boy, is this tension? Or what? Every time there was a whistle, I put my head down like this, and I would pick it up expecting time to have gone off the clock. They hadn't dropped the puck yet. The clock was exactly where it was where I put my head down. But I'm telling you, it was torture. thinking when Nathan Lafayette hits the post in the third period. Is that really how, how close this is from being taken away? There was a point when one of those posts was hit during the third period where I simply thought, okay, this is how it has to be. If they're really going to win it, they're going to wring every bit of pain, anger, sweat, frustration, and any other negative, tortuous feeling you could think of out of every Ranger fan's body before it finally happens. And we have 2.44 to go in the third period. They're on their feet, fans of all ages. And my first Ranger game was 1973. My dad took me. I'll never forget who was in net. It was Eddie Jockman. They might be on their feet in their homes, in their apartments, and wherever they're watching. I was a Ranger fan once because my dad actually worked on the garden as it was under construction. 1.31 to go. You know, for me, the greatest memories and maybe the, the most important memories of my life were the days that I spent at the Garden with my dad watching Ranger hockey. Moving to the net, knocked away by a sliding leech. One minute to go in the third period. We won.
watched games that we weren't going to. Road games. And road games you're watching together. When we weren't together, we were on the phone with each other. We knew that this was a very special season. We're down to 10 seconds. Ends up back behind the goal. Cannot work it around the ball. Ends up being cleared by Gray. I remember the puck was going down the ice, slowly down the boards. And I looked at the clock, and there was about five seconds left. And I was like, we just won the Stanley Cup. I turned to Mike and I dropped my stick and I gave him a hug. I'm looking around and, you know, the crowd is kind of mixed. I'm like, this isn't the right reaction. Oh, wait a moment. Apparently, icing was called. I'm looking at the clock and I'm, are they going to put more time back on? We can't, this can't happen right now. It can't happen like this. They put a half a second back on the clock. It's 1.6 seconds left. And, I, and at that point, I, you know what? I don't even think I'm, I'm still realizing that this is actually potentially going to happen. You're still wondering, you know, what else could go wrong. In your rational mind, you know they're probably not going to score. But after all you've endured as a Ranger fan, you can imagine the Vancouver face-off person shooting the puck over, you know, over Richter's shoulder for the tying goal. I just felt like we had one more face-off and we had been nailed on that one before and it wasn't going to happen this time. set out your entire life to do this. Everything you've been doing in the last, you know, months and years have been pointed to this, this instant. The enormity of it starts to dawn on you. When the final buzzer sounded, the leech was in front of the net and we just hugged each other. Then we're like, you know, we couldn't believe it. Over, this is unbelievable! Let the celebration begin! I think a lot of that energy and um, happiness came out in our team and that's what made me like kind of freak out because they, like, Adam Graves was going absolutely crazy and then he kept on saying 1940. <laughs> I thought it was very poetic that the crowd in unison chanted 1940 as the final time to lay the demons to rest. I just remember hugging, jumping up and down, going nuts. There was a kid sitting a couple rows behind me who was in a tuxedo, and he held a sign that said, I missed my prom for this. That kind of like says it all. People were, they were cheering and, and dancing, and people were throwing confetti on the ice, and it was just, you know, pandemonium. It was the moment you waited your whole life to have, and you wanted to enjoy it and just soak it up. These guys have white gloves on, carrying the Stanley Cup. I started crying. I couldn't help it. I just, um, I get emotional now just thinking about it. We started kissing people around the section we didn't even know. They're the champions. And I just collapsed on the couch and I just started sobbing and I started crying and everybody else that was in the house was kind of having the same reaction of, oh my God, that's it, they did it, it's over. Captain Mark Messier, come get the Stanley Cup. Captain Mark Messier, come get the Stanley Cup. Captain Mark Messier, come get the Stanley The realization of being a part of something special was awesome. Eddie Olchek. Be able to lift that thing up and look up towards the garden and the ceiling and to see the reaction of all the fans. When I picked that cup from him, it was like a feather. Just lifted it up in complete joy. It just was amazing to think that for years we had been talking about this moment and what it would mean to be here and to, and to win, and there it was. This is worth waiting for. Now I Can Die in Peace is something that I think hundreds of thousands of Ranger fans, yeah, 
wanted to express. We just did it. It was just a culmination of, of everything that we knew about dad waiting a long time and it was definitely the right time. We put that sign up to so express. the players could see how we felt about all those years of heartache. It was a heck of a celebration on the ice. This is the greatest photo that team sport that these players will ever have. In the locker room. Get him, boys, over! Yeah, we did it! It could not have been hotter in, in the Rangers' locker room. And Adam Graves came up and poured ice cold champagne down my back. And it was one of the most spectacular sensations I've ever felt. And then uh, eventually walk out of the garden at about 5 in the morning and still see thousands of people on the street waiting to see uh, the players. It was totally amazing. I remember just walking with my buddies straight down 7th Avenue just saying, I cannot believe the New York Rangers are the Stanley Cup champions.